Last time we discussed how to actually evaluate many Lebesgue integrals. In essence, it boils down to calculus. If your measure is a nice enough radon measure on the real line, for example, if it has a density. Now, this is quite limiting in at least two ways. First, not all radon measures on the real line have densities. And second, we need to compute expectations of random variables on abstract probability spaces, not particularly on compact intervals on the real line. Well, we'll handle those two problems in turn. The first being, when does a density exist, and how do we handle the case when it doesn't? So let's think about that in more general terms. Consider a general measurable space with two measures on it. How can we tell if one of them has a density with respect to the other? That is to say, how can we tell if there is some non-negative measurable function rho such that d nu is rho d mu? That's shorthand, as we've discussed, for nu being evaluated on any measurable set, taking the value integral over that set of rho d mu. When such a density function exists, we perhaps have more tools to calculate the measures. Now, there is one fairly straightforward condition that certainly must hold if such a density is going to exist. And that is as follows. Suppose that the measure mu, the one we're trying to find a density against, charges a set with measure zero. Well, if that happens, then if a density exists, suppose that nu of a can be calculated as the integral over a of rho d mu, since a is a set of measure zero, we know that means that this gives zero. Integrating over a set of measure zero always gives zero. And just to be clear, that's true even if the density function rho takes infinite values because of our convention that in the measure theory world, zero times infinity is equal to zero. Let's formalize this notion. Given two measures, nu and mu, on the same measurable space, we say that nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu if whenever the mu measure of a set is zero, the nu measure of that set is also zero. Now this is the same word we noted in the last lecture, talking about a strong kind of continuity for functions that is contrary to what we saw in a particular counterexample to densities existing. And there is a connection between those two, but that's going to stay a little nebulous for us for now. This is a notion of comparing two measures, absolute continuity of one measure versus another. The calculation we did here shows that if we want a density to exist, we must have absolute continuity. The beautiful thing is that the converse is also true. Absolute continuity implies the existence of a density. And that is the radon nicodeme theorem. It applies in the case where the measures are sigma finite. In our world, measures are typically going to be finite, so this is no impediment. Given two sigma finite measures on a measurable space, one is absolutely continuous with respect to the other if and only if there exists a density comparing the two. That is, if and only if rho of any set is calculated by integrating that density over the set A. And again, for shorthand, we write that as d nu is equal to rho d mu. Moreover, that density is unique up to a set of measure zero with respect to the base measure mu. Now that follows from the uniqueness theorems we've already seen. If I have a genuine measure nu, which can be computed on a set in two different ways as integrating a function rho one against a or a function rho two against a for any a, then the difference between those two functions will have integral zero over any measurable set A. And that implies that those two functions agree 
except potentially on a set of measure zero. You're going to explore that on your homework. In this case, that nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, and therefore a density exists, we refer to that unique up to a set of measure zero density function as the radon nicodem derivative of nu with respect to mu, and use this calculus kind of notation for it. Now, one might just think of this as a kind of neat way of rewriting this relationship here by dividing by d mu. However, it actually has a real meaning similar to the meaning that such derivatives have in calculus, at least in particularly nice cases that we are familiar with. For example, if our measurable space is actually Euclidean space equipped with the Borel sigma field, the case that we're often most interested in, and if the two measures mu and nu are radon measures, which, as we know, in the case of Euclidean space, means that they are Borel measures that charge all compact sets with finite measure, then this radon nicodem derivative of one with respect to the other as a function at each point x can be computed as a derivative-like limit. You take the limit as a radius epsilon goes to zero of the new measure of the ball of radius epsilon centered at x divided by the mu measure of the same ball of radius epsilon centered at x. And that will hold true for mu almost every x. There's no point in asking for it to hold everywhere since we know the density function is only defined up to a set of measure zero. So the radon nicodem derivative really is a kind of derivative in the measure theory world. But let me make two important comments. The first is that this is not a good way to prove it. Defining that function, showing that it exists, is already a very hard task. And of course, it's only true in the absolutely continuous context like this. Using this definition to show the radon nicodem theorem holds is not the right way to go about proving it, at least not the easiest way to go about proving it. And one further indication of that is that this kind of characterization does not hold in general measure spaces. It fundamentally uses the topological structure of Euclidean space and the nice Borel structure of the sigma field here in order to make sense of this. In general, such a description may not be available. Now, we are not going to make any real attempt to prove the radon nicodem theorem. We could, we have the tools to do it, but it relies on some very nice functional analytic ideas, in particular the Riesz representation theorem, which if you were taking a graduate course in analysis, would absolutely be a key topic that you would be covering. For us, the result itself is fairly ancillary. We are typically not going to be checking whether a measure is absolutely continuous with respect to another one and therefore concluding that a density exists. In probability theory, we will usually know things about the distribution at the start that we will use in order to make further calculations. And so we're not going to devote the two hours or so of lecture that will be required to fully develop the tools to prove this theorem. But it is good to have in our wheelhouse. Now, let's go a little bit further, in fact. Suppose that nu is not absolutely continuous with respect to mu. This theorem will tell us that nu does not have a density with respect to mu. But does that mean that it's just totally singular with respect to mu? Well, we can actually be very precise about what that means. So here is an extension of the radon nicodem theorem. It's actually often called still the radon nicodem theorem, although this particular extension was proved by Lebesgue. Again, in the same setting, suppose I have two measures, mu and nu, that are sigma finite on a measurable space. Then either one of them has what's called a Lebesgue decomposition with respect to the other. So nu has a unique Lebesgue decomposition with respect to mu, and that means that we can write nu as a sum of two measures, nu a and nu s. Nu a is the absolutely continuous part of nu with respect to mu. Nu s is the singular part of the measure nu with respect to mu. It is mutually singular from mu, which means exactly the following. There is some measurable set a, which this singular measure 
gives total mass zero, but for which the original measure mu is fully supported on. That is, it has full measure with respect to mu. In other words, its complement has measure zero with respect to mu. That is the Lebesgue decomposition, and it is not hard to prove that if a measure has a Lebesgue decomposition, that decomposition is unique. The existence takes a lot of work, again, that we are not going to take the time to do, since this is an interesting but ancillary result for us. Just to demonstrate a kind of typical example here, suppose that we have as our base measure mu, the Lebesgue measure, on the Borel sigma field in the real line, then we might have a measure nu defined like this. The nu measure of a set A has one part which is computed by integrating a density against Lebesgue measure over A, but it also has a singular part which is some positive linear combination of point masses at some points in the real line. Point masses are prototypical examples of singular measures with respect to Lebesgue measure. So this is set up exactly so that this part is nu a. Indeed, we have that d nu a, where nu a is defined to be that integral, is equal to rho d lambda, which is exactly what the radon nicodem theorem tells us absolute continuous measures look like. And as for these, well, they are all mutually singular from Lebesgue measure. In fact, the whole combination of them is because the Lebesgue measure of this countable set of points, whatever we chose them to be, is zero. Lebesgue measure of a countable set is always zero. But this singular part measure, this thing here, of the complement of that set of points is also equal to zero because those point masses put all of their mass at the points xj. So that's a typical example of mutually singular measure from Lebesgue measure. And this is a typical kind of Lebesgue decomposition of a measure with respect to Lebesgue measure. Except I've misled you a little bit. If you think that typical means everything looks like this. In fact, we're missing a big piece of the puzzle here, one that we've already highlighted a few times. This kind of singular measure with respect to Lebesgue measure is called a pure point measure. And those are certainly singular in the context we're considering here, but not every singular measure is pure point. And in fact, our favorite weird example, the Devil's Staircase, gives us the typical singular continuous kind of measure. Remember again, this is a continuous non-decreasing function that rises from zero up to one on the unit interval but stays flat on the complement of the Cantor set. Since it's continuous and non-decreasing, it is the cumulative distribution function of a unique radon measure, which we'll call mu f. Now, since it's continuous, that means that it has no point masses anywhere. However, this measure mu f is still mutually singular with Lebesgue measure. And that's because the Cantor measure of the complement of the Cantor set is zero. Indeed, all of these flat parts are in the complement of the Cantor set. And so, using the definition of how the radon measure mu f works, if we try to calculate the measure of any set that is contained in that complement, we're going to get f at b minus f at a summed up over some b's and a's that are each inside one of these intervals. And f at b minus f at a will therefore be zero in each case, because those are flat. On the other hand, we know that the Lebesgue measure of the Cantor set is zero. That was one of the first calculations we did with Lebesgue measure. And so here we have a measure, mu f, which is mutually singular from Lebesgue measure, but it has no point mass anywhere. So here's an update to the Lebesgue decomposition theorem. If mu and nu are sigma finite measures on a measurable space, then nu has a Lebesgue decomposition with respect to mu that is unique and can be broken up into three parts. It has an absolutely continuous part, which therefore has a density, 
It has a pure point part, which is a positive combination of countably many point masses, and it has a singular continuous part, like this bad boy up here. That is, this is a measure which is mutually singular from the original measure mu, but which has no point mass. In practice, we can't do a lot of explicit calculations with singular continuous measures unless we actually know the cumulative distribution function. But these measures actually come up in the wild, not just in contrived examples like this, as we'll see later on in this full year course. So keep that in mind. You cannot ignore singular continuous measures. They will be important. Now that we have the radon nicodeme theorem and the Lebesgue decomposition theorem under our belt, we still have this big gnawing question. How does any of this help us actually compute expectations of random variables? From the previous lecture, we know we can use good old calculus if those expectations turn out to be computable as integrals with respect to Lebesgue measure or integrals with respect to radon measures on the real line that happen to have densities. But we see that this doesn't always happen, even over the real line. And more generally, how are we supposed to do those calculations if the expectation, as we expect in most cases, is computed with respect to an abstract probability measure, not one on the Borel sigma field on the real line? Well, to that latter point, it turns out that the expectation of any real-valued random variable can be computed as an integral with respect to a radon measure on the real line. And that's what we'll see next.